I suppose there are two things to think about there, and, and that's the role of the translator as author in the production of a, a book. Mm -hmm. um, but then also, when it comes to the kind of marketing of the book, um, how do the roles of the translator and the author work then? Sort of, so during the book and after the book, mm -hmm. as it were. Um, mm -hmm. And um, I suppose the first one, for me, is, is very interesting and is, is the one that people write about and think about most. So, you know, when you're translating a text or an author, um, what is your relationship with them as a, as a translator? And, and I, I don't want to talk about, you know, fidelity and, yeah. uh, and all that. I mean, that isn't very interesting. But I suppose, I mean, I can talk from experience and, and perhaps sort of think about some of the things it raises. I suppose the first thing is that very often if well, it depends what one's translating. I mean, that's very boring, isn't it? But it depends what one's translating. If one is translating um, a new author, for example, mm. then I think there'll be a, a different relationship with the person that you're um, ferrying over into, into a new language, mm. than if you're doing a, a kind of new radical version of Shakespeare. Mm. Um, uh, and perhaps you have a lot more um, freedom, actually, if you're doing Shakespeare. You, you, can, you can do something very special. I, I was uh, a judge on a number of competitions, translation competitions, and, and one of the things that sticks in my memory was um, Edwin Morgan's fantastic translation of Racine into mm. Scots, uh, sort of Glasgow dialect. It was fantastic. Now, but if that was the first translation of Racine, you couldn't do that, actually. So there's a, there's a sort of um, a different responsibility. Um, depending on what you're translating and, and then and from that responsibility comes a different relationship. In the example I gave, so Edwin Morgan, um, you've got an already established author who can allow himself um, a kind of license also dealing with a dead a dead writer. Um, and another thing might come in there, which is that if a text is uh, bilingual, mm -hmm. so that if a book is being published, so that actually you're not you're not uh, eclipsing an author, but standing alongside an author mm -hmm. um, across the pages, and and actually people that have the language, the, the percentage of the readership that have the language, will be able to look up and check. Um, and now that's both um, a kind of discipline in itself, mm -hmm. um, and slightly paranoid making about the reviewers um, but also it gives you huge freedom uh, and to take an example I, I worked with an author so a living author um, and it was the first translation of her work um, and so in working with her and it was a bilingual text I we were able to look at something and uh, I read it and said well, I'm not sure that this works and everything so first of all she changed it she changed the original okay, um, yeah. which is you know, kind of really nice and, yeah. and feeds into the idea of translation as a kind of first privileged reading yeah. critical reading and I think there's a lot in that actually yeah. um, but also then in one poem um, we talked about um, some uh, Mickey Mouse came up in it uh, and just in terms of the sound in the English Minnie Mouse was better and so it's Minnie Mouse in the English but because it stands alongside actually everyone can see that that's a decision not a mistake mm -hmm. uh, and I think mm -hmm. one goes in fear of, of being thought to make a mistake actually as a translator I'm just reviewing a book at the moment and I won't mention it uh, because actually although it's really rather good there's this huge introduction um, which lists everything all the decisions that the translators made well, of course, you know, this I've translated as this, and and it's so defensive. Mm -hmm. But actually, I think, you, you know, it, it's about letting the word, you know, the translation stand uh, as a text at a certain level. You're not kind of defending it and constantly being in between it and the, and the world. There are kind of two or, or a number of related points that I mean, I think it's true that, that I think if you're translating someone who isn't known, um, you, you have a huge responsibility, actually. Mm. Um, of course, every foreign author wants a translation into English, um, mm. uh, although funding exists you know, for so many other directions of translation, but actually what they want is a translation into English. Yeah. Um, and, and their reputation for the rest of the world depends on their English translation, because mm. that's the way many countries will read them. Um, not in their original, but in English, yeah. and then they'll get translated. So it's a huge and very important bridge. Um, and there, I think, especially if it's not a bilingual volume in any sense, that um, actually you, you are your duty is to a kind of um, invisibility mm. more than if you're uh, treating a well-established author and uh, and have a history 
of translations against which you're also pitching yourself. The big debate isn't there about the, you know about the role of the translator mm. um, and the relationship with the, the, the text about whether um, the translator is, is somebody who's self-effacing mm. uh, in a sense and that there's a sort of transparency about translation which can happen um, or whether um, and this is particularly the case with very strong um, voices creative writers poets novelists who translate mm. that they're actually um, intervening far more and far more visibly and ostensibly uh, in the text um, and that has both pluses and minuses in, in that it makes it very often a very um, a dynamic uh, encounter mm. and, you, and you really see an encounter in the text which yeah. is very exciting um, but also it can end up as a, a kind of a whimsy or, 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 or a kind of peculiarity which is, is there um, uh, and you're seeing more of the translator than you might want or um, or might actually be called for mm. sometimes. Um, uh, uh, but it's quite a difficult area and people will have very different opinions about it. Um, but you know there are a number of, of recent translations which have done very well but been hugely controversial actually because um, the, the, the original author is eclipsed in some way mm. and you're actually with all the, uh, the, the paranoia and the uh, and the flamboyancy of the translator and, and, and that translator as a, an author has then claimed authorship in a quite a different way and, and that uh, runs through into all kinds of ways so for example in, in Amazon um, it was a real struggle to get Amazon to list the translator as an author yeah. so that it, they're actually there yeah. um, and so the books can be backtracked back to them and, and some publishers don't do it or you know whether you have the name of the translator on the book uh, on the front cover on a title page of pretty much nowhere <laughs> you know so there's a politics of it actually um, depending on who the translator is and who the author is uh, and, and the kind of cultural assumptions around that um, but then what happens when let's say for the sake of argument you've got you've got a translator who isn't more famous than the author that they're translating um, and who's representing them in some way I think um, do they become an author I mean I think uh, in certain circumstances, yes, um, uh, in that broader, uh, in that kind of media-generated sense. Um, you made me think immediately of a, a reading I did with um, someone, so it was a bilingual reading, so it wasn't quite what you're saying about mm. replacing them, but it was standing alongside them yeah. and presenting uh, the, the poems. Um, and it was a poet, a, a rather amazing poet called Brigitte Olszewski, who um, was kind of very floaty and wrote a lot about voice and body and how the voice of her poems was only about you know her body and who she was and, and then I stood next to her and she was sort of wearing long flowing things and I was standing in jeans and docks <laughs> <laughs> and, and she was quite small and I was, <laughs> and I just thought well, you know hmm <laughs> so what is it about you know what how do my versions of what she's doing um, uh, react with you know yeah. the, the, these texts and I thought that was very interesting a lot of you know so but, but you have to accept don't you that, that actually once the translations are in a different uh, language they're, they're you know the, the texts are in a different language they're, they're texts on their own they're, they're out there um, mm. on their own there's a writer talks about them as orphans you know mm. in, in a foreign land and I quite like that mm. um, they're pretty much on their own and anything you can do to help them along I think as a translator is is welcome and, and you end up I would say less as a sort of re replacement for the author and more as a kind of PR for the author actually okay. well, that's what I my experience is yeah. so I've organized readings I've um, sent books out for review because the uh, publisher can't it seems um, mm. uh, I've uh, carried boxes of books up and down on trains to sales you know so um, and, and I have had wonderful experiences, actually, to precisely travelling around the country with, with authors who I translated and, and, and sort of doing a series of readings. We did a, a Seven City series once, and really we were everything, you know. We yeah. all, the translators were organised the whole... <laughs> everything got the funding, you know, we're driving in cars, booking the BMWs. <laughs> so, you know, so I think you can actually end up as, as, uh, as a, you know, a kind of working for your author.
I suppose there'll be a caveat there that it depends a bit on the publisher and, and the author concerned. I was very lucky there that I was dealing with a very open-minded uh, author who wanted to uh, have contact with me, yeah. and uh, and so it really was a genuinely exchange. I mean, more often, uh, I, mean, I think a, a, a lot of authors want to work with their translators and want to work closely, mm. but sometimes it can be quite a fraught uh, mm. relationship. Um, generally, uh, an author will say, uh, and this is particularly true of poetry, um, uh, it's not. It's not about the content. I mean, you know, it's it's just the music. So you have absolute freedom. You have absolute freedom. Uh, and then as soon as you give them your your sonnet, they say, oh, <laughs> but that image isn't there, and yeah. and, and that rhyme isn't masculine. And uh, <laughs> say, yes, <laughs> you know, it's the tension. And um, and of course, yeah, it's completely understandable as well. Um, so so more often, it's a kind of negotiation. Um, but then also there is a, a sort of uh, more outward-facing or professional kind of relationship in that you also have a relationship with the author, but also with the publisher. Mm, yeah. um, and publishers intervene yeah. quite often. They have yeah. house styles. They have things that are uh, that they consider more or less risky. Um, I did a very interesting workshop in Berlin last year with uh, so it's half translators from German into English and half translators from English into German. Uh, and it was very interesting that German publishers, so publishers that in Germany that publish English books, um, are very conservative indeed. So whereas there was one translator who was working with a fantastically experimental, poetic American text, which was full of slang and you know very provocative, um, it had to be all smoothed over in the German translation, and it wasn't any of those things. And, and we all were aghast and said, you know what? But it was the publisher who intervened, and and it was kind of normalising everything as to what would sell. And so I mean that's quite an extreme. Or, or what was. Um, what was possible, I think, probably. Um, what was possible, their judgment of what was possible and, 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 and saleable, um, probably. Um, but, um, so it's, a comp it's this compromise thing, isn't it? About I, I talked before about a kind of a lexical shock, mm -hmm. but which isn't too much of a shock. Mm. Um, I once translated um, a, a wonderful prose text by Val Schott, and, uh, which is a kind of lyrical novella. Um, and first it was stymied by publicists that, that called it a prose poem, which is the kiss of death on it, <laughs> any book on the shelf. But, um, but um, it was also, um, when I did it, I did it for, I did it kind of straight and, and made it work and, and I hoped made it sing, you know, which is what he said he wanted in English. Um, and then um, the publisher liked it. Um, but then he looked at it and said, no, it's got to be much stranger than that. It's got to be much, much stranger than that. Yes. And so I went over it again. And, and it's true that I, I'd made it, I'd made it, it was something I did very quite early on. And I'd made it akin to the things I knew. Because yeah. that's your touchstone, that's the way in, you yeah. know, finding it that's a bit different, but not too different. But he wanted it much stranger. And, and I think the end result is, is very strange. <laughs> Well, <laughs> maybe in years to come, eh? You know, and like, oh yes, look at that magnificently strange translator. So there's the relationship with the publisher. Um, I, I interviewed a fantastic translator, um, Frank Heibert, who uh, is a translator and an author in German, and he translates from a number of languages. Um, uh, was translating from English into into German when I when I talked to him, talked to him from French and so on. And he translated some Amos Oz, um, and I remember talking to him about the. the the short story because it had um, in the German it had um, a sort of I think it was a Chekhov quotation at the front uh, and there was kind of, it was very uh, literary the presentation of it um, and then in the English there was this vast uh, number of footnotes at the end because the English publisher, the publisher had obviously said, look, this is too difficult. We need, you know, all these biblical names examining and so on, and, uh, you know, and, and giving to an English readership. Um, and so it's, I mean, I think, you know, there's obviously the, the translator, Nicholas Delong, who did a fantastic job with it um, uh, into the English, whereas Frank Heibert had done it into the German. Um, you know, they're, they're catering from different, for different markets. The publisher is demanding different things. and. Um, uh, you know, it'll end up very different, uh, and it was rather fascinating to, to look, you know, from 
the way things have gone in very different directions from the Hebrew into English and to German mm -hmm. because of the publishing market. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so yeah, so there's a relationship with the author, there's a relationship with the publisher, and there's a relationship with the reader, and the translators sort of uh, constantly bringing these things together and juggling them a bit, I think. Yeah. And, and the, the translator has responsibility for all of them. I mean, it seems to me that there, there is a kind of uh, a version where the translator is transparent, but actually that's a lie because you're never transparent. Actually, there's always all kinds of choices which are preconditioned by all kinds of things, so society and politics and ideology and your own linguistic experience and your own broader experience. Um, and so actually what you should do, it seems to me, as a, sort of the politics or the ethics of translation demands that that is made visible actually um, and so I prefer not to see the quirks of a translator I would actually like to see the author I don't want the quirks of a translator in my face but nor do I want this pretense at invisibility so I think for me it's come down to something um, about the, the, the kind of uh, the, the ghost in the machine the murmur you know of the translator in the fabric of the translation um, because it's not you know so it's not totally naturalized it bears um, its its origins and, and its its sort of trajectory um, and so you know the, the highest praise if someone's looking at my translations especially if they can see the two the, the original and the translation is that actually hey that's different um, because I'm different um, but I can see through that translation I can gain I can gain an, an access yeah. into the original that I've somehow caught the spirit of the original or because of course the form and the sound and the words all changed they've all changed every single thing has changed yeah. but somehow um, I've got to be a conduit to a to a kind of spirit or to something that I've recognized somebody earlier today was talking about empaths yeah. um, and how every research project needs an empath and I nearly shouted every research project needs a translator <laughs> <laughs> Because that's what it's about. Yeah. It's not just about reading the words.